I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. So, on last week's show, I spoke with Philip Salamone, and I talked about how he actually had a studio that was right across the street from the one that I've been going to since 2005. So this week when I was out there, I looked across the street at his place, and I saw a sign that was on the window. I walked over to look at it, and it turns out the sign was a public hearing notice. The proposed action is to demolish the building that he's in. So his studio, where he teaches his students, is actually going to be torn down in the near future. I messaged Phil about this and asked him, first of all, if he even knew that this was happening, which I assume he did. It is his building. But he had just gotten back from a trip to New York, and he messaged me back saying, I didn't know that they'd put a sign on there, but yes, I did know that that was going to happen. So he is going to be relocating, but it's a temporary relocation. So I hope that he'll be able to find a place to continue doing the work that he does and helping people. But I found that kind of sad because I just discovered that place. When I originally sent out my request for artists to come talk to me, one person that commented, is this just for artists or would you also include writers as well? And as I saw that, I thought, yeah, I mean, writers are creative people too. So I told him, of course, that would mean writers. I'd love to talk with you. Chris is a sci-fi writer, and he has his own series that he's been putting out called Metamore City. And what's interesting about what he does is he's been doing audio of his stories. Now, not just audiobooks, which he does release. He also releases his stories as he writes them on his website as a podcast. Chris has been self-publishing. He has books on Amazon, and he's got his audio stories that he's been releasing. So this week, I meet writer Chris Lester. You've been doing it for a while, so you've had, um, well, it's the same podcast, but it's gone from one place to another. It moved over to your blog, right? So I started podcasting in 2007 with the, the Metamore City podcast, which was envisioned specifically as a a sort of enhanced storytelling experience with music and character voices and sound effects. It was sort of intended to be a a hybrid between audio drama and audio book. That ran through early 2010. After that, I went on hiatus and I was intending to come back and do the same thing with my second novel but it was just, it was too much of workload and I wasn't getting enough time to write. Eventually ground to a halt after I finished my second novel in 2013. Okay. I wrote almost nothing for nearly two years. And partly that was because of some things that were going on in my personal life, um, some transitions and having a job that took a lot out of me. And partly it was just because... I was not feeling like the connection to my audience anymore. Mm -hmm. Then in, I think it was in the summer of 2014, a good friend of mine, a fellow podcaster by the name of PG Holyfield, uh, suddenly came down with a rare form of aggressive cancer and died in the space of about two weeks after his diagnosis. It was a wake-up call for me that I don't know how much time I'm going to have to do this. I don't know how many days I have left to write and tell stories. One of our our mutual friends uh, named T. Morris contacted me after PG died and said, you know, I want to do a tribute collection. And will you write a story for it? And so I did. And that sort of started the juices flowing again. And in May of 2015, I started my new podcast, which is called The Raven and the Writing Desk. And it's stripped down, very you know, simple, it's minimal sound effects, minimal music, just me reading my books. Your books are sci-fi based. Yes, science fiction, urban fantasy. So I think of it, it, it's in the same general genre as like E.E. Knight's The Vampire Earth Mm -hmm. or um, the Shadowrun RPG series. 
it's a futuristic world where magic is present. When did you discover like, oh, this is the style I want to write in? It was about seven. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, yeah. I mean, like the very first story I can remember writing was about a, a plesiosaur and an ichthyosaur <laughs> and their friendship. And it was dictated to a teacher's assistant at my Montessori school. It was dictated? Wrote, dictated. I, I told the story yeah. out loud. She wrote it down in her typewriter. All right. Um, that was kind of the start of me telling stories. I've never really stopped since. I like how but that I've one always... actually was you telling the story. Right. <laughs> I, you know, I grew up listening to my mom read to us to me and my brother mm -hmm. and so spoken storytelling has always been a very strong part of my culture especially fantasy and science fiction because she would you know read to us the chronicles of narnia and the hobbit and lord of the rings and out of the silent planet and the red wall series and you know all of these these great imaginative works of, of fantasy and it just that's where my brain goes mm -hmm. now would you say that you write science fiction and turn it into audiobooks or would you say you write for audio in the metamore city podcast um i started writing for audio I started writing in, you know, I'd been writing for years, but as I was doing the podcast, I started thinking about how is this going to to sound and what can I do, especially in the first novel that I, I wrote, Making a Cut. That was a story that I knew was going to be podcast. I was podcasting it as even as I was in the process of finishing it. So that was a story where I was thinking about, okay, how am I going to portray this as, you know, when I put it into the, the show, there's a, there's a scene in chapter nine where the two of the characters are on the dance floor and one of them um, starts dancing and there's a specific piece of music that I knew I wanted to play in the podcast. And so I wrote the scene, I put that song on loop as I was writing the scene. Is it weird that I'm picturing the canteen music from Star Wars? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it was a trance number. And uh, so I'm, I'm playing that over and over again as I was writing it. And so that shaped the scene, just internalizing that as part of the storytelling experience. So I've done a bit of writing for audio. I've done audio dramas live at each of the... Um, each of a number of Balticons that I've been to. Yeah, I, I listened to one of those. Did that happen in, I, I want to say it's a 2015? I've done, I think, six or seven of them you know, over the course of the last 10 years. First so of all, what is, a, what is a Balticon, just so people know? Balticon's a science fiction convention. It's a literary convention organized by the, science, the Baltimore Science Fiction Society, but it's also become homecoming for podcast authors. How did you find Baltimore? Because right now you're based in the Madison area. I found Baltimore because that was where my friends were going. They were convening there. We just we kind of took over the new media track at that convention and we've we've had it ever since. Creating audiobooks, that can't be easy. Well, I guess I keep calling them audiobooks. Would you call them audiobooks? I mean, it's it's a very similar format. Like the audio that I'm doing right now, I take it and I immediately export it for the eventual audiobook. You can take the same audio and use it in both. Podcasting has a some advantages for audience engagement. It's such an a, an immediate mm -hmm. sort of um, art form. Like you know, I'll I'll get voicemails in and and play them and discuss them or you know respond to something that somebody said on my Facebook group. There's a, a live sort of interaction with your community that print authors and and authors who are just putting out books say on Audible. Mm -hmm. don't necessarily get um, because there is that back and forth as the as the story is coming out i think also the serialized nature can help to build excitement for stories over time because as a story is going on you build up people's anticipation because they can't just read ahead yeah and find out what's going to happen and so you get all this 
fan speculation going on of you know how things are all going to turn out and that's always fun well and most of the the audible ones are really just narration occasionally you'll find one where it's like oh this is an ensemble piece like i'm listening to uh the lock and key collections right now with oddly enough Haley joel osmond which is weird nice. but i've been really enjoying that and it's it's definitely a different way to go about listen reading to a book mm -hmm. yeah my first encounter with that was in Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials, the audiobook version of that series uses a full cast. Okay. And I listened to that and was like, hey, this is really interesting. This is a different way of telling stories because you've got the actor's performance as part of the the experience. There are narrators who can do that just as an individual narrator. Jim Dale, who does the Harry Potter books, is really good at giving each character their, a distinctive voice. Hmm. James Marsters, who does the Dresden Files, he's really good. But not every narrator is that talented. In chapter one of Making the Cut, I had 11 characters in one scene. So I was not confident in my ability at that point to give each of them distinctive voices, which was one of the pressures to go out and find people to voice those characters for me. So you, it's kind of like you created like a theater troupe. I did. Now, the problem with that and the reason one of one of the reasons why I stopped doing it is that I can never sell that audio because the law says that if somebody does work for you, that you turn around and sell, you have to pay them. Mm. And the professional rates for audio work are far above what I can afford to pay on the front end to get a book out. Mm. Since I don't have thousands and thousands of dollars sitting around waiting for me to do something with them. You don't? Come on. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> and so I, I that story is kind of stuck in podcast land unless I decide to either record re-record it all myself mm -hmm. or go but you know somehow scrape together the money to pay everybody when did you first release your first written work like when did you actually put out a actual book whether it be physical or an online book when would you say you did that i started back in 1996 i joined an online writer's community it was done over a mailing list Oh, wow. Yeah. Like physical in, mailing list? No, 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 no. Okay. Mailing okay. Mailing Just making sure. Okay. You never know. Way back, in, way back in the day. So it was a community of writers who wrote stories in these shared universes that we would craft together. And then we would share those stories with one another. You know, it was an audience of maybe a few hundred people. I think that maybe at, at its largest, I think the mailing list was maybe about 800 people. Mm -hmm. So that was the first place that I put my fiction out in public. Oh. Um, I then put a lot of those stories onto onto a website. That website is still in existence, but I'm not going to tell you what it is or where it is. I think I'm I already know. Of, <laughs> I'm kind of embarrassed by it. Yeah. I did some research on you. I think I may have found it. I may not have, but out of respect for yeah. you, I'm not going to name it. So thank you. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. I was writing under an alias in those days. Oh, and so this was back back in the days when having your your full name and public identity on the internet was kind of seen as being risky. And Isn't that funny? So, <laughs> I yeah, remember yeah, those yeah. days. It was weird, like putting stuff out like that was a scary thing to do. Now people take a picture and go, I'm going to post that thing right away. <laughs> yep. You know, all of my my early sort of developmental stuff was uh, under that alias. What made you first feel, I guess, confident enough to release a book under your own name? So when I looked back at stuff that I had written in 1999 and 2002 and 2004, and I still could say, this is good. I'm not embarrassed by this. Mm -hmm. So the fact that it had stood the test of time was the, the main thing. And I didn't know whether it was going to whether it was going to fly or not. Did you go to school for writing? I was um, I was actually homeschooled. And OK, my mom was my my teacher and she had me do a lot of writing and so it was just the combination of reading a lot being read to a lot mm -hmm. and then just doing a lot of writing practice as part of my schooling that i learned the rules of writing pretty much by osmosis and you know of course yeah. she would read 
read what I was writing and she would give me, you know, feedback on the, the grammar and the construction. And she'd say, you know, this, this character feels kind of flat to me and, you know, stuff like that. And so I was able to refine my my skills through that early feedback. That's got to be tough. Like, okay, so you're creating an actual universe mm-hmm. and people that maybe physically or, you know, in actual real life could not exist. It's got to be weird to take criticism or critique saying, well, that sounds a little flat. And it's like, well, you don't know. <laughs> but no, see, the thing is that it wasn't really hard to take that, that kind of criticism because uh-huh. it was like, okay, I can see that these, you know, I knew my mom was as big a nerd and sci-fi geek as I was. Okay. And so, you know, to when she would say, you know, I'm, I'm having a hard time connecting with this character, you know, it was it was easy to see like, oh, it's not just be- that she doesn't like this kind of thing. It's like, this is something I need to work on as a writer. Okay. The reason I ask that is because that's one of the things I've always thought of there is training involved in say whether you do in artwork or writing i mean there's a basic structure it when it comes down to it the person expressing themselves it's still a creative output and it's so it's so hard to tell someone no that's not right but exactly what you're saying is it's building from that taking the advice and going are they right or are they misunderstanding what i'm talking about who's to say that drawing a stick figure and putting it on the wall even though you have like years and years of fine arts training isn't right just the fact that it's like as long as you know the basics i find it so hard for people to give critiques the way you explain it that's a great point like you know you you were able to learn from that do you put out physical versions of what you do too, or is it mainly digital? You do. So I have I have two full length novels and two story collections in the Metamore City world, um, which are all available in both ebook and Dead Tree edition. Okay. Books three and four are both available on Audible as well, and I'm currently working on producing the audio for book one. I'm working on the fifth book in the series right now, and that one is about 90 to 95 percent done so i'm hoping to have it finished by the end of this month what ways do you promote yourself doing your books promotion is something that i'm i'm still trying to figure out what are the most effective ways to get your book in front of as many eyeballs as possible Mm -hmm. but it's not something that i have very much knowledge about yet some of the things that i know to do based on what i've read i have not had the opportunity to implement in practice yet because this fifth book that I'm writing right now is the first book that I've I will have finished since learning this stuff. It's going to be interesting to see how how that plays out when the time comes to launch. Obviously the podcast is an ongoing method of self-promotion. It's a way of getting my my fiction in front of people in in trial size bites that they can then see if they like it and if they want more they can pay for it. I've experimented a little with with Facebook ads but I haven't really had any conversion on that yet. What type of things have you tried doing with the Facebook ads? So I've run a um, 99 cent promotion on my the first book in my series, uh-huh. you know, it was an Amazon countdown deal. When that was running, I ran a Facebook ad to to promote that. You know, it got in front of about 1,400, 1,500 people, but I didn't get any sales from it. So whatever I did there, it did not work. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> so, All right. Um, I do have a mailing list. I'm not using it yet as efficiently as I probably could be compared to, to some of my peers. I am at this point trying to, because of my my list has been kind of building for several years now i'm trying to figure out who's still engaged so i've i've been uh, starting to look at some of the metrics that something like that mailchimp provides mm-hmm. um so i can see okay how many people are actually looking at this and all right i'm going to send out a special mailer just to people who've opened the last one that i sent we'll see how that how that works out when you're out in uh like at balticon it's called right balticon yeah. balticon there we go i knew i was saying it wrong when, when you're out there do you guys discuss sort of the the networking and discuss uh methods that other people use because i feel like that would be a prime place to do it especially at a networking event like that i'm going to be honest like 90 percent of the reason why i go to balticon is to see my friends oh okay so, well there's nothing wrong well, with that you know yeah exactly so i i'm i'm not walking into that with a mind of i'm going to leverage my 
core competencies and multiply my force multipliers and you know it's well, like, i mean you know maybe maybe you should i don't know <laughs> like this is the one time a year that i get to see these folks and we're gonna have dinner together and you know we're gonna sit around and shoot the shit and have but a that's drink. but and, that's that's one of those things you see those those old movies and people are like darling you simply must try this new method you know it's i don't know why for some reason i was mrs howell when i was doing that but you know <laughs> I understand that, but you're also with like-minded people who are probably having the same problems. Mm -hmm. I find it interesting that that doesn't come up. I mean, it does a little bit. We yeah. were, I was on a panel with some of my, uh, my fellow writers and some of my fellow voice work people talking about why the, the author needs a narrator. Um, and so discussing the merits of hiring someone to read your audiobook for you. And if you don't, what, you know, what are the things that you need to get good at in, instead? Um, so there was some of that shop talk stuff. Okay. Um, it largely, for me anyway, it was taking place in the context of being on panels rather than the conversations we're having at the bar, you know, afterwards. It's like, yeah, we've just been talking about this for an hour. I just want to know, you know, what's going on in your life. Oh, yeah, <laughs> of course. You, of course, you shouldn't be consumed by that. I know. Out of all the things that you do, what would you say you probably are having the most success with? Which one would you say you feel like is actually getting the most people or the most attention? The thing that's making the, me the most money right now is my pa my Patreon campaign. I run a behind the scenes podcast for my, my Patreon supporters where I will talk about either the story that we were had just aired in the podcast that week i'll talk about like the process of writing it or some of the easter eggs in it or things like that whatever's on my mind about that story as i'm as i'm re-listening to it mm -hmm. or i'll talk about you know hey this is a, a story that i'm working on developing right now and these are some of the thing the ideas that i'm putting into it bonus art that goes out on that feed I have a, uh, an artist who is producing black and white illustrations for me based on scenes from the stories that have aired. As that is in the process of being developed, I'll like take the concept sketches or the, you know, the preliminary work and I'll put that out as previews for my, my fans. How did you find um, the artist for your books? They were listeners. So oh, cool. you know, folks, folks who uh, enjoyed the stories. And so when I put out a call and say, Hey, I'm looking for, artists to to provide bonus art for these stories and a couple of them are like yeah please me me <laughs> yeah. one of them actually started out by just sending me fan art like hey you know i drew a picture of this character and i wanted to share it with you and so i'm like yes please can you do more of this i will pay you <laughs> mm -hmm. it's just so uh interesting how like-minded people even though they have different backgrounds it's you never think of the fact that it's like well i could just ask people there's got to be some people mm -hmm. who do artwork that listen to my stuff or read my stuff people who are already listeners to the show i know that they are going to understand my stuff i know that they are going to get what i'm you know driving at now for like cover art i still have detailed conversations with with professional cover artists and okay. you know hire them like making the cut and things unseen and in the new book the lost and the least all have professional commissioned cover art by experienced you know sci-fi fantasy cover artists mm -hmm. that's an area where I'm, I'm still like going to places like deviant art in order to find people yeah that's um, a good place to go yeah it is a good place. It's a great place to find people who are early enough in their careers that they're still below market rate. <laughs> and so, you know, but in a good a, way, a, you know, and there's a lot yeah. of sci-fi and fantasy there too. So that's a, that's another reason why it's a great place to look. It is, you know, it's like, you know, you're helping each other. You're in your early stages of your career. They're in early stages of theirs. And so you can help each other by cross promotion as it were. Yeah, exactly. Even though he's a writer, I still think that everything that all the people I've spoken with apply. He's doing things like creating a Patreon account. And even making books is something that artists can do. I mean, putting together a collection of work, even if it's just images, that's still something you can do on Amazon. You can find out how at Kindle's own self-publishing platform, which is at kdp.amazon.com. So I want to thank Chris Lester for talking with me. And really, I think being the first writer that I've ever spoken to, I don't know if I know any writers. If I do, I apologize to any of my friends that are listening to this that are writers. 
So thanks for listening to this episode of American Bandito. You can visit our website at AmericanBandito.com, and you can read my daily comic journal called Then This Happened at AmericanBandito.com slash Then This Happened. It's a story about me and my wife going through her recent bout with breast cancer. Sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's not, but it's a very personal thing, and I'm kind of proud of it. The music for today's show is by Romcom. That's com with two M's, and you can find out more at romcomtheband.com. And don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts and Google Play. Now, if you want to get weekly updates on this show, you can also get them by email by going to americanbandito.com slash subscribe. And there will be links to all the different ways that you can subscribe to the show there. I'm talking with somebody new next week. I'm Tom Ray. I'll see you then. So long. Thank you.